Today's parks are designed to take the hit from hurricanes, to absorb the waves, to serve as a buffer between the ocean and neighborhoods. And that'll be the new purpose of East River Park. I don't think that this project is gonna be done for 10 years. There's not gonna be a park for 10 years here. And that is really destructive to people's health around here. I got involved the minute I saw the plan. It didn't take a second before me and my neighbors saw that the plan was to destroy the park. People who worked on the plan, you know, truly regret it. They had built up a relationship with the community and they didn't do this to be, you know, untransparent or mean or anything like that. Um, however, it just played out that way. I have been deeply disappointed because I like to buy the idea that this is a progressive city with a progressive government. And what I found out over the months of working on this is that there is a political machine. East River Park is this beautiful 1.2 mile long riverfront park with a promenade, with playing fields, with picnic areas, with trees. When you go there on a Saturday evening in the summertime, there are people all over having parties, they're dancing, they're walking, they're biking, they're taking their dogs around, they're sleeping in the grass. It's just the most vibrant place. The reality of climate change has created rising seas and damaging superstorms. The world's biggest cities from Miami to Singapore are developing plans to protect their coastlines. Politicians, activists, and environmentalists all agree that urgent steps must be taken to protect coastlines. But how to do so without destroying property and parkland is the challenge. Solutions involve painful choices, a scenario that is playing out in New York City's East River Park, pitting the city against passionate local activists. You can find uh, these little pockets of nature in the East River Park for you know, millions of people every year over the course of the, the seasons. From the 1930s until 1960s, our Parks Commissioner was Robert Moses, who was also the city's highway coordinator. So very often he used parkland for highway right-of-ways because it's the path of least resistance. This was the Great Depression, money was tight as it was. Here was an ambitious public project that, in the view of Robert Moses, served many constituencies. Commerce, as far as highways went, and at the same time, the public. The city's decline began after World War II. With a massive migration to the suburbs, federal government disinvested in the cities. East River Park fell victim to natural neglect, meaning if people don't maintain the park, nature takes its course, erosion, Invasive plants, overgrown plants, vandalism takes its course. In the midst of this changing neighborhood, photographer and journalist Pat Arnau decided to pack her bags and move to Lower Manhattan after raising her family in the South. So I lived in the South for 21 years. One thing in the South is uh, it's a lot of uh, white people and you come to a city like New York and here the clatter of languages and people of color and everybody looks different from everybody else. And I just thought that was great. The East River Park sits adjacent to several public housing projects with residents who can't afford weekend getaways in the Hamptons. The connection to the park is that it's a natural resource for the Lower East Side. We don't have green spaces. The only wildlife we have is the rats that live under there. We don't have what most people and affluent communities have, which is access. Joan was there when Hurricane Sandy tore through the region, hitting the Lower East Side with a vengeance. The worst is yet to come from Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy crashing on shore. Winds now at 90 miles per hour. Let's bring in ABC weather editor Sam Champion, who's been tracking this all day. He's in lower Manhattan tonight, where there could be a huge storm surge. 
Hurricane Sandy was the second costliest storm in U.S. history. Sandy impacted 13 states. It was 650,000 homes were damaged or destroyed. Over 8 million people experienced power failure. So it was a big wake-up call for our region. After Hurricane Sandy, the federal government encouraged cities to propose development projects to protect their coastlines. The East River Park project was part of this initiative, and the city received federal funds for the project. Amy Chester was chosen as leader of this renewed force for building with the community. Rebuild by Design really ensure that communities had a voice at the table and that they were part of the decision-making process. Community members had spent months developing a plan with city planners. This plan called for a landscape berm next to the FDR Drive that would serve as the organic seawall to protect the park from flooding. But just months later, the city announced they were moving forward with a completely different plan. The city's new plan called for destroying the existing East River Park and burying it under 10 feet of landfill. Community members were shocked at what they heard. Uh, and that's what we're announcing today. An updated plan, it does incorporate aspects of previous plans. We recognize, we know this change comes as somewhat of a surprise. It may feel that we're changing the plan uh, at, at a late date, but we're happy to go through and explain the reasons why. I think everyone was really surprised. Uh, the city had worked for four and a half years with the community in a very collaborative way, and then all of a sudden there's a new plan. People in the community believe there is more to the story. The original plan included an extension to the park that would cause lanes of the FDR highway to close during construction. There is certainly a sense that there was an unwillingness to um, close a major roadway. The original plan was basically a renovation. This new plan calls for the park to be buried first and then build a park on top of it. Some critics caution the city is going to run out of money and not finish the promise of a new park. You're not going to get anything more after you spend $1.4 billion on this park. Another dollar will be spent on it. Back in the fall of 2019, before the final plan passed, residents sprang into action with the new group, East River Action. They called themselves the Actioneers. Their goal was to convince city officials to vote against the plan and implement flood protection that does not see the destruction of their beloved park. Joan Myers is a near comedian and longtime Lower East Side resident. She's put up banners in the park and regularly attends local community board meetings to voice her displeasure at the city's plans, while encouraging her friends to do the same. After you make a presentation, or you just want to give it in? To. Oh. I, I would, but if only four people can speak, it shouldn't, I shouldn't be one of them. No, it's, it's four per issue, though. So okay. if you're speaking oh. about some other issue, you know. She's uh, going to speak. Okay. Better not be for the thing, though. No. Oh, I'll take back. Community board meetings are one of the platforms actioneers use to complain about the city's plan. The topic of the day is the independent report where many companies and key players were not included in their view process. And even Con Edison, who loves a good con, they were unable to comment because the city did not provide any documents. Without feasibility and science behind this, this is just your mother's art project. Tempers flare at the community board meeting, but back at the 6th Street Community Center, a more friendly crowd hears out Joan's concerns. One of them is East River Action founder Pat Arno. The East Side journalist stepped up to the plate when our community needed her. And I've really had to learn how to step up and be a leader and uh, bring people together and, and have a little more authority in my voice and in my manner. Uh, that's been real hard for me, but, uh, but it also feels like I can help bring people together. I love all these crusty New Yorkers. With angry New Yorkers at her side, Pat sees herself and her group as a means to keep the city accountable and their promises to fight climate change. The city council passed a resolution that we're having a climate emergency, uh, that it's a climate crisis and that we need to do everything we can to make it better. And some of the city policies are really good that way. But this plan is the antithesis of dealing with a climate emergency in a coherent way. It, it is endangering the climate further, and it's endangering the climate of our neighborhood it's, we need the trees to breathe. We need the park for our mental and physical health. The health 
of the community is on everyone's minds as the actioneers and dozens of their neighbors gather in front of City Hall for one of their last protests. Creativity is certainly not lacking in this group, and for their last big protest before the final city council vote in November, as well as honoring Halloween, Pat and the actioneers pull out all the stops, leashes, and stakes to metaphorically kill the plan in full view of City Hall. Now we're here today to appeal to the city council to listen to us. They've been saying that they've been listening to us. Greetings! I am the plan, you punk stakeholders. I'm here to destroy your park and all those big trees that help you breathe. I'm going to spend years spewing landfills and the oppression. Which is just what I like. <laughs> so no, you will not. We know that there can be a better plan. So you don't think that the city council will listen? Oh, sure, we'll listen. We just don't do anything you want. But go ahead, waste your breath. Well, we've got to try. We've got a lot of great people here today Amen. to talk about it and to deliver our petition. <laughs> Petitions that for the most part went unheard. Councilwoman Carlina Rivera's district includes the East River Park, and she agreed to meet with Pat the day before the vote. Meeting with Carlina, alas, that was ugly. Uh, and I felt like she was condescending, uh, that I know our points are good. She was dismissive. Councilwoman Rivera and her staff declined to be interviewed for this documentary, but she did voice her concern for the lack of transparency and touted the fact that she negotiated for phased construction, which basically means the park will be closed for massive construction in sections over a period of time. This was not enough for the residents. Even though they knew that the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project would most likely pass, East River Action still packed the audience chamber of the city council to show lawmakers their disapproval. Most of the group was kicked out or left in disgust before the final vote. Ultimately, chance demonstrations did not sway council members. The final tally came out to 46 in favor, one abstention, and one against. The project would move forward. There's nothing left for the group to do but toast the East River Park. Now, I'd like to offer a little toast to uh, East River Park. It's not over yet. It's not over yet. It's not over right? till the bulldozers roll in. The group has not yet disbanded. In fact, as long as the park is open, you in all likelihood might run into an actioneer. Oh, hello. How are you? You had the hissy fit. That's great. <laughs> yeah. I wanted the hissy fit. Just went along. I know. Well, I had my hissy fit. Yeah. Yeah. I had my hissy fit. No, I know. And, it, and I just said, Carolyn, I am so sorry. You have lost my vote forever. <laughs> it's too short term because of that goal. So he, he, you know, he's not thinking habitat. He's not thinking about emotional attachment. There is no excuse for this. It's just, it's just the worst plan. It's really, we got caught in po po politi oh, political yeah. Faustian bargains that, you know, as always, mm. just so, I'm just so mad. It's just so short time. It really is throwing the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> The 
Actioneers felt the loss deeply, but almost immediately they began to plan new actions. Charles and Pat contacted a local lawyer who took up cases like these pro bono and started to draft a lawsuit. Arthur Schwartz has sued the government multiple times. He took up the case because he felt the city was not listening to United Community. It's not just one crusader fighting the government. This is a, you know, 15 organizations, scores of people that, that feel very passionately about it. They're creating a movement. Where I sue the government, pro bono. Pro bono and pro parkland, Arthur and the group is citing park alienation statutes, a tradition in New York that goes back hundreds of years. Before a park is converted to non-park uses, whether public or private, that has to be permission given of the state legislature, and that hasn't been given here. The city also has to provide alternative park space during this repurposing of parkland, otherwise known in legal jargon as alienation. If there's alienation, then the state can make cer certain demands on the city. One of them is mitigation, which is alternate park spaces. Right now, the alternate park spaces that the city is offering are really pathetic. The pathetic alternative space Pat is talking about is the city's request to bulldoze the Lower East Side Ecology Center's compost yard, a literal yard of waste to use as a playing field. Compost aside, the city's approach to not consulting the state has given the actioneers and the litigator a legal loophole to pursue action in court. In fact, I'm somewhat baffled about why the city didn't do that. $1.45 billion. They can't come up with a less destructive plan. I mean, that's a lot of money. We hope that the city can come to an agreement with us for the sake of the community in the Low East Side. And we've been playing by the rules this whole time, and it's time for the city to do the same. All right. Despite the community's disappointment in losing valuable green space, experts like Amy Chester understand the nuance of the issue. There is $335 million on federal funds that have a deadline. All of the funds that were um, granted through the federal government for Hurricane Sandy has a deadline of September 2022, which means that all the federal funds need to be spent by that time or Congress takes it back. Many coastal cities are trying to understand how to deal with catastrophic flooding. Miami is planting mangroves to absorb some of the rising floodwaters, while Puerto Rico is still reeling from damage left by Hurricane Maria in 2018. The island nation of Singapore invested over a billion dollars in improving its drainage system in the last decade. Climate activists are warning these actions are not enough. New and more extreme climate groups like Extinction Rebellion are demanding politicians to take action to address climate change instead of just passing reactionary policies. Pat knew she could try to make a difference on a local level, so she channeled her anger into activism. There are a lot of people who don't have the time, energy, or been through too many battles. And I was in a position where I had the time and the energy, uh, but more than that, I had this just overwhelming fury and uh, sense that I had to do something, even if it was going to be futile in the end, that I had to do something. But this is not the end. The lawsuit is entering a new stage as the lawsuit, Ease Over Action et al. v. City of New York, has 90 individual and 13 organizations signed as plaintiffs. While the case is being litigated, there won't be phased construction done in the park. The hope is to provide oversight on the construction and requirements for alternative park space. This might be a New York park, but coastal cities all over the world have to prepare for the ramifications of resiliency and work with communities instead of making closed door deals. It remains to be seen if the used New Yorkers will be able to use their park again, but they're still using conventional as well as creative methods to make their voices heard in City Hall. You will not. You will not.